Will the rapture of the church take place on Rosh Hashanah 2024, which begins on the evening of Wednesday, October 2nd, and ends at sundown on Friday, October 4th? The Jewish prophet Amos records that God declared he would do nothing without first revealing it to his servants, the prophets. From the Old Covenant to the New, Genesis to Revelation, God provides picture after picture of his entire plan for mankind, and one of the most startling prophetic pictures is outlined for us in the Jewish feasts of Leviticus 23. The Hebrew word for feasts, moed, literally means appointed times. God has carefully planned and orchestrated the timing and sequence of each of these seven feasts to reveal to us a special story. The seven annual feasts of Israel were spread over seven months of the Jewish calendar at set times appointed by God. They are still celebrated by observant Jews today. But for both Jews and non-Jews who have placed their faith in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, these special days demonstrate the work of redemption through God's Son. The first four of the seven feasts occur during the springtime. These are Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Weeks, and they all have already been fulfilled by Christ in the New Testament. The final three feasts, Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles occur during the fall, all within a short 15-day period. Many Bible scholars and commentators believe that these fall feasts have not yet been fulfilled by Jesus. However, the blessed hope for all believers in Jesus Christ is that they most assuredly will be fulfilled. As the four spring feasts were fulfilled literally and right on the actual feast day in connection with Christ's first coming, these three fall feasts, is believed by many, will likewise be fulfilled literally in connection to the Lord's second coming. In a nutshell, here is the prophetic significance of each of the seven Levitical feasts of Israel. Passover, pointed to the Messiah as our Passover Lamb, whose blood would be shed for our sins. Jesus was crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover, at the same hour that the lambs were being slaughtered for the Passover meal that evening. Unleavened bread, pointing to the Messiah's sinless life, as leaven is a picture of sin in the Bible, making him the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus' body was in the grave during the first days of this feast, like a kernel of wheat planted and waiting to burst forth as the bread of life, first fruits, pointing to the Messiah's resurrection as the first fruits of the righteous. Jesus was resurrected on this very day, which is one of the reasons that Paul refers to him in 1 Corinthians 15:20 as the first fruits from the dead. Weeks, or Pentecost, occurred 50 days after the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and pointed to the great harvest of souls and the gift of the Holy Spirit for both Jew and Gentile, who would be brought into the kingdom of God during the church age. The church was actually established on this day when God poured out His Holy Spirit and 3,000 Jews responded to Peter's great sermon and his first proclamation of the gospel. Trumpets, the first of the fall feasts. Many believe this day points to the rapture of the church, when the Messiah, Jesus, will appear in the heavens as he comes for his bride, the church. The rapture is always associated in Scripture with the blowing of a loud trumpet, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-18 and 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The Feast of Trumpets is also referred to as the Feast of the New Moon, for it is the only annual feast of God that commences with the lunar sign from the heavens. In ancient times, Jewish religious authorities had to wait until the new moon was actually seen by reliable witnesses. Before the month's activities could begin, the appointed time is stretched into two days, as no man knoweth the day or the hour. Thus, the authorities did not know when the Feast of Trumpets would actually commence. They did not know the day or hour. Jesus Christ made specific reference to this fact when he spoke of the time he would fulfill his promise to return, he said no one knows about that day or hour. It is the only feast day that is named as such, 
because they just didn't know which day was the correct day. Why two days? It is because of the uncertainty of when to declare the day, because the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets is based on the sighting of the first visible crescent of the new moon. And since the days counted are from the new moon to the next, no one is sure if it's the 29th or the 30th day of the month, so to be sure, they count both. During the feast, the trumpet is blown a total of 100 times, with the final horn blast lasting much longer than the first 99 blasts. This final blast pictures the trumpet sound, which many believe will announce the rapture of the church, which Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Disclaimer. I make no prediction of the Lord's return, as we cannot know the exact timing, but I am referencing scripture that gives us the information that points to a specific set of days as clues in his word. Day of Atonement Many believe this prophetically points to the day of the second coming of Jesus when he will return to earth, tabernacles, or booths. Many scholars believe that this feast day points to the Lord's promise that he will once again tabernacle with his people when he returns to reign over all the world. Many scholars believe the rapture will occur on the Feast of Trumpets. We are to be watching as Jesus commands us in Luke 21, 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. No matter what happens or doesn't happen on this upcoming Feast of Trumpets, we are to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Are your eyes fixed on Jesus? He is returning. Breaking news overseas, sending shockwaves across the world. Hezbollah just confirming that Israel's strike on Hezbollah headquarters in Lebanon killed the militant group's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, and it could signal a massive shift in this war. So let's go to ABC's Marcus Moore, who's in Beirut for us this morning. That word coming in just a short time ago, Hezbollah confirming that the group's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, was killed in a series of rocket strikes on the Dahia district, which is the southern suburb of Beirut. And as that word spreads, the airstrikes continue as Israel keeps up its attacks on Hezbollah. This morning, Hezbollah confirming its leader, Hassan Nasrallah, is dead following the Israeli airstrikes on southern Beirut Friday. But just hours after the first aerial assault, Israel warned people living in the southern suburb of Dahia to leave immediately as the IDF targeted more residential buildings. And this was the scene today in central Beirut. This bombardment forced thousands of families out of their homes. Many went to shelters, others went to be with other families. But then we see many who have ended up in the streets of Beirut. Abdul Rahman Azu told us he evacuated his family from their home at 3 o'clock in the morning. How much time did you have to, to run, to leave? He said they got the warnings to leave, and within 10 minutes, the bomb started falling. He's thankful he and his kids are safe, but he doesn't know what they will do next. In just one week, more than 100,000 people have been displaced. The death toll this morning from Friday's strike at 6, with more than 150 injured, but the numbers are expected to rise, according to the Lebanese Health Ministry, as rescue teams sift through the rubble, searching for any survivors. This morning, Israel claiming they're targeting Iranian-based weapons belonging to Hezbollah, some of which they say are stored beneath civilian buildings in the city. Hezbollah exploits and endangers Lebanese civilians using them as a human shield for its weapons. The U.S. said it had no involvement in the attacks. I can tell you the United States had no knowledge of or participation in the idea of action. Biden and Harris have undermined Israel every step of the way. They talk out of both sides of their mouths, saying Israel has a right to defend themselves, while at the same time telling Israel to de-escalate. This is no way for an ally to act. The United States should be standing alongside Israel instead of appeasing their enemies. Israel's enemies are an existential threat. And by the way, the enemies of Israel are also the enemies of the U.S. If Israel's enemies would just put down their weapons of war, there would be peace. The sad thing is, if Israel puts down their weapons, there will be no more Israel. Israel is the apple of God's eye, and the world including America, will be judged for its actions regarding Israel. Zechariah 2.8 For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you 
touches the apple of his eye. And just before the attacks Friday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu dismissing the U.S. plan for a ceasefire. Don't let Nasrallah drag Lebanon into the abyss. We're not at war with you. We're at war with Hezbollah, which has hijacked your country and threatens to destroy ours. Hassan Nasrallah became the leader of Hezbollah back in the early 1990s, and uh, the 64-year-old was a powerful figure here. And uh, his death not only will mark a major shift in this war, but really the tone for the entire region. The attack on Nasrallah potentially signaling a new phase of fighting in the Mideast. As we get word, the Israeli, mil Israeli military is mobilizing additional reserve soldiers. Israeli officials are saying they acted on real-time intelligence, blasting that Hezbollah HQ underneath those apartment buildings. And I was just on a briefing where the IDF said their intel makes them certain Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, was killed in that strike, as well as several other senior Hezbollah commanders. And make no mistake, Nasrallah's death will send shockwaves through this region. It's a huge blow for Hezbollah. He was its political, spiritual and overall leader for more than 30 years. The IDF calling him, quote, one of the world's strongest and most influential terrorists. And this morning, Israel warning that wave of attacks overnight in southern Beirut that Marcus was reporting on are not the end of its toolbox. But I think here in Israel and across this region, there is unease about what comes next. How will Hezbollah's backer, Iran, respond? Iranian officials are saying has Hassan Nasrallah's death has changed the rules of the game. And Israeli officials are conceding this morning that the threat from Hezbollah and its arsenal of tens of thousands of missiles and rockets is still there, adding Israel is ready for a potential wider escalation, saying there are tense days ahead. And, of course, the IDF is also preparing for a possible ground incursion into southern Lebanon. And some breaking news uh, coming to us here at Sky News. Iranian media is reporting that uh, the Revolutionary Guard uh, deputy commander was also killed in that bombing in Beirut. So Iran state media is reporting that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard's deputy commander um, has been killed in that Israeli airstrike that killed Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah. Um, he's been named as Abbas Nil Farushan. That's on Iranian television. So Iranian television also uh, saying that a, a, another high-profile, this time Iranian Revolutionary Guard general, has been killed in that bombing in the Israeli airstrike. So as we're learning more, we can see the impact and reverberations of that significant strike in Beirut and, and what that might mean, both in terms of uh, the Lebanon and Israel nexus and, of course, Iran's next step. Iran sees the network of armed groups it has formed across the Middle East as the axis of resistance. This was the statement of Iran's supreme leader, read out on television after Hassan Nasrallah was killed. The fate of this region will be decided by the resistance forces with Hezbollah at their head. Iran's enemies see these proxies as a threatening alliance. They're Iran's way of confronting them indirectly. Not just Israel and the United States, but also its rivals in the region. The most powerful group in the Axis remains Hezbollah. Its militants carried out terrorist attacks on U.S. and French forces in the past. In recent years, it has focused on fighting Israel and on backing President Bashar al-Assad, another Iran ally, during the war in Syria. In Gaza, the Axis comprises of Hamas and the Islamic Jihad. In Iraq, pro-Iranian Islamic resistance militias have joined the Axis. And in Yemen, the Houthi militia. Since October 7th, those groups have all tried to hit the Israeli territory. The Houthis also targeted cargo ships in the Red Sea, a key route for international commerce. Iraq's pro-Iran militants struck a U.S. military base early this year. Those are the groups Iran's leader has called to escalate their fighting with Israel. And although most of their attacks have been intercepted, Iran has provided them with a vast arsenal of missiles, which they haven't used to their full capacities. Ladies and gentlemen, the real war criminals are not in Israel. They're in Iran. They're in Gaza, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen. Those of you who stand with these war criminals 
Those of you who stand with evil against good, with a curse against the blessing, those of you who do so should be ashamed of yourselves. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's foreign policy is pretty simple. If you bless Israel, you will be blessed. If you curse Israel, you will be cursed. The world is in real danger of being cursed by God. And here's the truth. Israel seeks peace. Israel yearns for peace. Israel has made peace and will make peace again. Yet we face savage enemies who seek our annihilation. And we must defend ourselves against these savage murderers. I have a message for the tyrants of Tehran. If you strike us, we will strike you. There is no place in Iran that the long arm of Israel cannot reach. And that's true of the entire Middle East. Iran now seeks to weaponize its nuclear program for the sake of the peace and security of all your countries. For the sake of the peace and security of the entire world, we must not let that happen. And I assure you, Israel will do everything in its power to make sure it doesn't happen. First Thessalonians 5.3 While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Daniel 9.26-27 and 27. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, who is Israel, the Palestinians, and possibly other Muslim nations, for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In Bible prophecy, we are told in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, the prince who is to come, who is the Antichrist, will come on the world scene and strongly confirm a seven-year covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies. This covenant will kick off the seven-year tribulation. Are we seeing any signs of a covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies today? 1 Thessalonians 5.3 While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So how does peace and security lead to sudden destruction? And what is the sudden destruction? Is it the rapture of the church? Is it the revealing of the Antichrist? Is it war? While we can conjecture what the sudden destruction is, the Apostle Paul tells us Christians are not part of it. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-18. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In these verses of Scripture, the Apostle Paul is undoubtedly talking about the rapture of the church. The Apostle Paul continues in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, For when they say peace and security, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. The Apostle Paul makes a distinction between we and they. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says, We who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, along with the dead in Christ, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 5.3, Paul says, While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. The sudden destruction that comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape could very well be when the rapture occurs. This sudden destruction comes upon them while they are saying peace and security. Sudden destruction comes and this is where the distinction the Apostle Paul makes comes into play. They will not escape. That would seemingly indicate that we escape as we read in Luke 21:36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Sudden is the Greek word epnidios, which means 
unexpected, suddenly. Destruction is the Greek word alethros, which means ruin, i.e. death, punishment. First Thessalonians 5.3 could be translated like this. For when they say peace and security, then unexpected and sudden punishment comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Could it be that this sudden destruction is the rapture of the church? 1 Corinthians 15.52 tells us that the rapture will happen suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15.50-54 Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Twinkling is the Greek word repe, which means a jerk of the eye. By analogy, an instant, i.e. suddenly. Is the sudden destruction coming, and with it the rapture of the church? We see the prophesied Antichrist right onto the world stage in Revelation 6-2. Immediately following the rider of the white horse beginning his conquest of the world, we see peace will be taken from the earth when the rider of the red horse of war begins his ride across the earth as we read in Revelation 6, 3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Those who are here to see this, will be as those who lived in the days of Noah. All will be well and life will be moving forward as normal when suddenly a flood of God's judgment will begin to fall on mankind which will last for seven years, the culmination of which will be the visible, physical, bodily return of Jesus Christ to the earth at Armageddon. So as we look at what prophecy predicts is going to occur, potentially in the not too distant future, the world is someday going to rejoice that peace has finally come to the Middle East. What will follow that, however, will be anything but peace as the world is suddenly going to explode into warfare. Is the sudden destruction coming, and with it the rapture of the church, the revealing of the Antichrist, and war? All those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will not be here to see the terrible time to come wherein God's judgment will fall upon a world that has forgotten Him. Where will we be? In the presence of Jesus Christ our Lord as a result of the rapture of the church. And there will be no announcement as to when that will take place whatsoever prior to it occurring. And if you find yourself hereafter it occurs, your future is going to be horrific. The stage is being set for Daniel's prophecy concerning the arrival of the Antichrist, which will be preceded by the rapture of the church. The only conclusion one can draw from all this is this. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Consider this a heads up if you're a Christian, and be forewarned if you're a non-believer. If you're watching this and you don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, it's time to get to know him, and the sooner, the better. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what? If his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning, my prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! and I don't want you to go there. We've been reporting on the bizarre phenomenon that seems to be taking place not just in this country, but all over the world. Getting angry at God isn't going to solve anything. Don't but dad me, young lady. I done said you can see that boy when we get to church. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Place across the state. Lord, have we not prophesied 
in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works and then Jesus said I will profess unto them I never knew you este ha sido una mañana muy espantosa de un catástrofe después del otro depart from me ye that work iniquity so robes and positions and titles and classifications and auxiliaries and departments and works and paying your tithe and paying your dues will not save you. We are still experiencing the aftershocks of the massive earthquake that have devastated this entire region. But if you want to be raptured, you must be born again. You must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's so hard. We've all been left behind. <laughs> it's going to be joyful for those who are raptured, but it's going to be sad for those who are left behind. Life, life as we know it. You swore to me that you were going to get yourself together and start coming to church with me. Not today, okay? I'll go with you next Sunday. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, Repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.